The final four takes place on the men's and women's side this weekend, and who better to come kick it with us on a Friday night than the one and only Fran Fraschilla. <laughs> What's going on, Fran? I see your background out there in Colorado. How you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. No background. This is this is no frills. This is no frills. But you do have me, and I'm here, and I got internet access. And do you guys know I spent three years recruiting John Wallace to Providence College, and he left me hanging? Oh, wow. Man. You too. Wow. Three years. I, I, I recruited him when he was, when he stunk, and then he got good. <laughs> 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 well, maybe that's the reason why he didn't go to Providence because he thought he stunk and he went to the Orange and took care of business. <laughs> no, but he he did he did take care of business, so that's good. Great to be with you guys. That's All right, Fran. So uh, some big news come out comes out this weekend. Two longtime coaches at their respective universities announced their retirement. The latter, I think, the one that people questioned was it an April Fool's joke. Lon Kruger moving on from Oklahoma, but Roy Williams also moving on from North Carolina. You've covered these guys, competed against these guys. What was your initial thought? Yeah. Well, Lon Kruger is, uh, is ready to go back to Las Vegas. His son is the new coach at UNLV. He's got grandkids out there. He loves golf. He's got a beautiful home out there. So great for Lon Kruger. But Roy Williams... Uh, amazing career, you know, and, and Roy was also getting up there in age. Not that he couldn't keep doing it, Monica, but, you know, um, I'm happy for him. He stepped aside at the right time. He wants to spend some, some time, uh, you know, doing other things besides coaching. And he's a Hall of Fame coach. So I say great to go yeah. out on your own terms. It doesn't usually happen that way. One time for Roy Williams. I missed that that sneaky game that he got to pull off Definitely. a lot of times on the Tar Heels. He had some fresh feet. But uh, yeah. speaking of college yes, coaches uh, changing location, uh, Chris Beard, who helped build Texas Tech into a national powerhouse, had Mac McClung being an all-conference player, taking his talents to the other Texas squad, the University of Texas for the Longhorns. Uh, yeah. Would love to know your thoughts on that move, Fran Frasillo. It's crazy. You know, he went to school at Texas. And Texas has a great national brand. He took, he took Texas Tech to heights they never got to in basketball. Almost won a national championship. Remember, they lost in overtime to Virginia yeah. in 2019. Yeah. Yeah. But it is Texas, and he, he did go to school there. He worked for Tom Penders, uh, former Fordham coach. And, uh, hey, good for him. Um, he gets a chance to go to a place that he knows well. And as I said, they have a great national brand. Kevin Durant. Uh, LaMarcus Aldridge, DJ Augustine, Royale Ivy, go on and on. Uh, so, so good for Coach Beard. Um, okay, so we've got some names we know moving around or ultimately hanging up there. I guess coaches whistle. Yep. But we've also got some new names in terms of the coaching um, cycle and some fresh blood. Kyle Neptune leaves Jay Wright's staff as an assistant at Villanova to take the head coaching job at Fordham. And then in that same vein, Fran, um, Kim English to George Mason. So we've got two young, bright, up-and-coming stars in the coaching game. No question about it. Let's start with Kim first. Uh, Baltimore kid, I, I covered him when he was in the Big 12 at Missouri, played in the NBA, played overseas. And he's going back home to the DMV, as they say down there, Monica. You know about that. And uh, I think he's going to do a mm -hmm. great job. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So he, he knows that area well. He's going to do a great job. And then Kyle Neptune is my guy. Brooklyn guy like me. Uh, my son Matt is still on the Villanova staff as the video coordinator. Uh, Kyle gets a chance to go to Fordham. He will do a great job there. High energy. He's going to hire a great New York, New Jersey staff. And uh, it's an A-10 school. And quite frankly, guys, and I don't mean this as, uh, you know, cast aspersions on Fordham. They really can't get any worse. So it's only going to get better under mm -hmm. Kyle. And I think he's going to do a great job. Seriously. I mean, I'm not, not to, you know, not to badmouth him, but they just haven't hey, had a man, good program you, uh, you, in a while. You, you, it's, it's what we it is. We bring you on here to keep it real, friend, and it don't get more real than that. That is very true. <laughs> Fordham has seen better days. I am mad at it, though. Shout yes. out to the Bronx. I love them. <laughs> yep, um, no doubt. Okay, friend. having said that, we've got to get to yep. your tweet because the transfer portal has Ooh. been quite the hot topic, my friend. And so let me just read this off here. I know you can't <laughs> see this. The transfer portal is open and student athletes are flooding through it. Yes. 
quote, freedom of movement, finding a better fit, yada, yada, yada. But some of it is pure <laughs> inability to handle the slightest adversity that sports brings. Fran, tell me why you are not the angry grandpa. Get off my lawn, guy. <laughs> no, no. Listen, Monica, there's not one thing in that tweet that's a lie. I, I believe if a kid wants a transfer and it happens all the time, no problem. Want, you want to find a better fit, maybe more playing time. You can go on and on. But what's happening right now, in my opinion, is that young men and maybe some women too, I don't follow it as closely on the women's side, they, had, they hit a little bit of adversity, not willing to be a little patient. And all of a sudden, guys who are playing a lot of minutes at big schools are leaving. I mean, quick, uh, young man from Georgetown, where you went to school, Wahab, he's mm -hmm. playing for Patrick Ewing. He's potentially an NBA yeah. prospect. He's, he's getting better and better. So all I'm saying is no problem with transferring, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be crazy. Uh, and I do think that there are times, many times, where a young man is just not willing to uh, either wait his turn, be a little patient with his success, and I think they're, they're leaving a little too soon in some cases. Okay, so quick follow-up on that, though, Fran. We've got plenty to get to with you then. What is the solution? Is it about players building intestinal fortitude, or do coaches need to do more to make players comfortable? What do you see as a solution here? Well, let me get back to the middle of the screen here. But uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's everything. I, I, I think it's everything. There's no question, Monica, that um, you build a relationship with a young man when you recruit him, you bring him to your school. And you guys know this. Um, once you're at the school, the coach has an obligation to continue to build that relationship. You have to recruit these young men mm -hmm. and ladies every single day, even after they come to your campus. And, but I also have seen situations where that's, that's happening and they're still not happy. And so I, there's two kids today, believe it or not, one kid leaving, he's leaving Xavier to go to Ohio University. Do you know where he started his career? Ohio University. He's going back to the school that he just transferred from a year ago. That's insane. So, hey, mm -hmm. I want every young man and lady to be happy, find a right fit. All I'm saying is there's no perfect uh, Shangri-La. Uh, going to college means handling bumps and bruises, having a great experience, making friends for a lifetime. But if you keep jumping around from school to school looking for happiness all the time, I'm not sure you're going to find it totally every single time. Now, Fran, there's a whole lot of changes coming to the NCAA from the transfer portal to coaches leaving. And now uh, yep. several high-profile NCAA players are meeting with NCAA President Mark Emmert to speak about many issues, one of them including name and likeness and their ability to make money yep. off of their brand. Um, I would love to know your, your thoughts on that. And uh, where does this leave the NCAA going forward, especially with uh, the, 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 the rule changes coming to the NBA as far as coming out of high school, a lot of people going overseas, yeah. the overtime elite league? Where do you think NCAA is going to go as far as this, this is concerned? They better, they better adjust quickly because NIL is coming. And if it's not the NCAA, it's going to be the states and it's going to be the Congress. And quite frankly, uh, these young people who do have a chance to, to – uh, to benefit from their name, image, and likeness, I think they, ought to they are going to get the opportunity. There's no question about it. Now, how it's done, to me, from what I've been told, it's going to be done by outside sports marketing agencies. And they're going to say, well, this young lady who plays at Georgetown, we can, you can make this amount of money if you do this kind of advertising. And that's great. You know, Zion Williamson would have made a fortune at Duke, deservedly <laughs> so. And I I'm all in favor of that. But I also think that we have to be careful that, um, you know, not every athlete is going to benefit from this. So my big thing is this. Yeah. Things have changed, Monica, since you were an athlete at Georgetown. These kids now, uh, between all the food, travel, academics, no student loans, Nike equipment, it's a great deal. In some cases, a, a Georgetown, you know this, a Georgetown scholarship might be worth a half a million dollars if you're a student athlete. Mm -hmm. Having said that, if you, if you have an opportunity to, to benefit from your name, image, and likeness, I am all for it. And it's coming. There's nothing we can do about it. And I'm not saying we should do anything about it other than let it happen organically. Let these young people benefit from the amount of effort and work they put in 
to their teams because it's here. It's here and it's about to become part of college athletics. I continue to maintain that if you're one of those big time programs, whether it's football or men's or women's basketball, hire somebody on your staff to help these kids navigate yes. this because I'm with you, Fran. It's coming. Now, we do have yes. Final Four and cha a champion will be crowned this time next week for sure. So we got to talk a little bit of matchups. We start with Houston and Baylor, Fran. Who do you like in this one and why? Oh, man. First of all, Monica, all four coaches are some of my closest friends. Uh, and in this game between Kelvin Sampson and Scott Drew, these two guys I, I just absolutely love. It's going to be a street fight. It really will be. Both of these teams have uh, smart, tough, hard-nosed players. And um, Houston, Houston is relentless on the glass. Baylor's relentless with the guards. Baylor, i got to tell you guys, they're not as good as they were pre-COVID. 21 days with no practice in February. Eight kids had the virus. They're in the Final Four. They're not quite as good as they were. I think Baylor wins a squeaker. I love both of these teams. Baylor survives. So, friend, uh, I want to hear your thoughts on the David and Goliath, which I never <laughs> thought I'd see with UCLA <laughs> being David and Gonzaga being Goliath. Who do you got winning that one? Isn't that crazy? I mean, Gonzaga's a small little Catholic school in Spokane, and, and UCLA is as big an underdog in this game as we've ever seen in the Final Four. I, I just think the Zags, the only way you beat the Zags if, if they play one of the couple worst games of their season. Uh, I love what UCLA's done. Mick Cronin's brought toughness, but I just can't see the Zags. I mean, they got five guys on that starting lineup that can all get 20 I can't see all of them, Cass, having a bad day. Um, it would be the story of stories in, in Final Four history if UCLA wins this game. I think we're going to see Baylor, Gonzaga Monday night. And remember, it's a game all of us were talking about back in November. So hopefully we'll get the game we, we wanted all along. UCLA knocking off Gonzaga is potentially like what Arizona Ooh. women are maybe trying to do against UConn I know. right now. I mean, heading this three is looking real close. I'm quarter. looking at the score. I'm yeah, like, uh -oh. Arizona, is, Arizona is up <laughs> 10. Okay, Fran, before we let you go. Yeah. Yes. Before we let you go, is there a player or players that significantly improved their draft stock through this tournament? Ooh, good question. I'm not, not necessarily, Monica. I will tell you this. Um, uh, Kate Cunningham did not play great, but he'll still be number one or number two. I think uh, if there's one guy that I think is the sneaky number one overall pick, it's Jalen Suggs of Gonzaga. Uh, remember this, guys. I'm going to take you back in history. In 1994, big dog Glenn Robinson was clearly the number one pick in the draft. But Jay Kidd went number two. And as good as Big Dog was, Jay Kidd has probably, you know, had, had an amazing career. So, to me, Jalen Suggs is the truth, even if he goes number two or number three. To me, he's a baby Chauncey Billups, one of the best two-way guards that mm. we've seen in the NBA in the last 25 years. So, I think Jalen Suggs has helped himself because whether he goes one, two, or three, he's going to be a great NBA player.